Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. Today I want to talk about why slims and hierarchical reasoning are the future. I'll start with a little credit to Dr. Scott Walter who pointed me to this thread from Shruti and I read the thread. It's very interesting. I, I think it might be a little bit overhyping it saying the AI industry made a $57 billion mistake and no one's talking about it, but you know, you've got to lead with what'll get clicks and quickly this has gotten quite a few views with 380,000 views. So she does a better job with titling than I do, obviously. So anyway, we'll start with that, but we're going to move to directly to the articles. I'm going to go over the articles just a little bit, but what I want to focus on is the sort of combination and the idea that we're actually moving from a period of exploration to a period of optimization. At least that's my contention in this video. And what I mean by this is when you're first trying to do something, when you're doing a research project and you don't know what the answer is, you don't even know if there is an answer, for example, what you do is you just throw everything at the wall. You just make it work. And if it works, you're satisfied with that. But the consequence of that methodology is that you're not optimized at all. You're just kind of throwing things at the wall. You're seeing what sticks. And if it works, you're using it. But the things that work will often not be very efficient. In other words, it will cost a lot of resources to do whatever it is. Now, this isn't just for software. It can be for hardware and things. You know, you design a new type of airplane or something like that. Think about the Wright brothers. They made an airplane. They, they created something that flew, but it was definitely not the most optimized design. And it took years and, you know, decades to come up with a much more optimal design for an airplane and one that could go quickly and burn less fuel and all of that kind of stuff. So anyway, it's that kind of thing. It goes with software as well. You just try something and make it work first. And that's sort of where we are with large language models right now. We're just burning massive amounts of compute resources to make these models actually work. The cool part about what I'm seeing here and a definite tie-in to Tesla itself is the idea of efficiency and optimization. Tesla has had to do this for years because they're trying to do real-time full self-driving on the road with limited compute resources. So they have been forced into optimizing what they're trying to do at a very, very aggressive pace. But when you compare that to the large language model or AI industry overall, they have massive resources. And so people are willing to throw a lot of compute resources at something just to make it work. And that's fine. Again, we're at an early stage of this. But what I'm seeing here is the first sort of steps towards optimizing, towards making something work much more efficiently than it does right now. And I have an idea of what the future is going to look like. But first, let's take a look at these two articles. This one is from the 2nd of June of 2025. And it's really a position paper from NVIDIA. In other words, it doesn't have a lot of proof. It's more thinking about things. The title is Small Language Models are the Future of Agentic AI. And of course, large language models are LLMs and these are SLMs. And I'm just calling them SLIMs because I think it sounds better. It's easier to say than SLM and it actually makes sense. You know, they're small, they're slim. So anyway, I'm going to call it that and we'll see if that catches and if people use that terminology, I would I would like that. I think that's actually a good way to refer to this and it's much easier. And acronyms, people like easy to remember acronyms. So I think that has some advantages. Anyway, large language models or LLMs are often praised for exhibiting near human performance on a wide range of tasks and valued for their ability to hold a general conversation. Very true. The rise of agentic AI systems is, however, ushering in a mass of applications in which language models perform a small number of specialized tasks repetitively and with little variation. And very quickly, if you don't know, agents are different than sort of chatbots because they're able to go off and do multiple steps on their own. They don't require human interaction at every step. That's kind of the basic definition of what an agent is at this point. But of course, as opposed to chatbots, agents really, really up the token cost. In other words, the thinking cost, because they have to think, they have to do something, they have to think some more, they have to do something. So there can be a lot of tokens generated, a lot of compute resources burned to do a single task that a human assigns this agent to. So with that definition in mind, we'll continue reading this. Here we lay out the position that small language models or SLIMs are sufficiently powerful, inherently more suitable, and necessarily more economical for many invocations in agentic systems and are therefore the future of agentic AI. Now, I have a twist on this. We'll get to that at the end of this video, but I don't think that these alone are the future of agentic AI. But anyway, hold that thought. Our argumentation is grounded in the current level of capabilities exhibited by SLIMs, the common architectures of agentic systems, and the economy of large language model deployment. We further argue that in situations where general purpose conversational abilities are essential, heterogeneous agentic systems, i.e. agents 
Governments invoking multiple different models are the natural choice. We discuss the potential barriers for the adoption of SLIMs in agentic systems and outline a general large language model to SLIM agent conversion algorithm. Our position, formulated as a value statement, highlights the significance of the operational and economic impact even a partial shift from LLMs to SLIMs is to have on the AI agent industry. So in other words, operational is like how you do things, right? It's the operations of things. And economic is how much does it cost? So if you're burning fewer compute resources, there is a major economic gain to be had. So you've got kind of a double whammy or a double plus thing, right? <laughs> double plus on good, double plus good. Anyway, we aim to simulate the discussion on the effective use of AI resources and hope to advance the efforts to lower the costs of AI of the present day. Calling for both contributions to and critique of our position, we commit to publishing all such correspondence at this URL. So again, this is a position paper that don't have proof of this. It's just a theory and an idea of where things are going. And just one more thing to touch on on this article. And of course, I will leave links to the originals in the description so you can read them at to your heart's content. Anyway, working definition one, a SLIM is a language model that can fit into a common consumer electronic device and perform inference with latency sufficiently low to be practical when serving the agentic requests of one user. So in other words, it might fit on your phone or your laptop or your automobile or something like that. And it operates locally on the edge and it's good enough to work for what a single user wants. And then working definition two is a large language model is a language model that is not a slim. So that's pretty straightforward. And then we get to the contention that there are three major benefits to these slims. Number one, they're principally sufficiently powerful to handle language modeling errands of agentic applications. So not everything, but at least language modeling stuff. Two, they're inherently more operationally suitable for use in an agentic system than are large language models, generally in the sense that they're more efficient, they use less compute, and they're faster. And then three, kind of a consequence of these other steps is they are necessarily more economical for the vast majority of language model uses in agentic systems than their general purpose large language model counterparts by virtue of their smaller size. And then finally, they conclude, on the basis of views V1 through V3, SLIMs are the future of agentic AI. So with that paper from NVIDIA in mind, let's take a look at this paper from Sapient Intelligence. Again, I'm mostly going to focus on the abstract here, hierarchical reasoning model. Reasoning, the process of devising and executing complex goal-oriented action sequences, remains a critical challenge in artificial intelligence. Current large language models, or LLMs, primarily employ chain-of-thought techniques, which suffer from brittle task decomposition, extensive data requirements, that's a biggie, and that relates back to the efficiency argument, and and high latency. In other words, they're very, very slow. Inspired by the hierarchical and multi-timescale processing in the human brain, so our brains are pretty cool, inspiration, we propose the hierarchical reasoning model, or HRM, a novel recurrent architecture that attains significant computational depth while maintaining both training stability and efficiency. So in other words, it can could dive deep, basically. Instead of being very, very broad and general, it can go very, very deep into a task. That's the sort of twist on large language models. HRM executes sequential reasoning tasks in a single forward pass, so that's really cool, it doesn't have to go back and forth, without explicit supervision of the intermediate process through two interdependent recurrent modules. So in other words, there's two things that sort of talk to each other. A high level module responsible for slow abstract planning, so that's the sort of higher level reasoning model, and a low level module handling rapid detailed computations. So this would be the difference between you as a human thinking about a math equation or something and walking into the kitchen and filling up a glass of water. You don't have to think about that very much. That, that requires a different type of computation. And you can start to see here where this would actually have an effect on real world robotics immediately. You have this sort of abstract abstracted reasoning layer, and then you have the much more efficient, faster computation layer that sort of does the stuff you need to do based on what you're thinking about. And here's the real kicker with this. With only 27 million parameters, which is absolutely tiny, I mean, we're looking at models that have over a trillion parameters now, HRM achieves exceptional performance on complex reasoning tasks using only 1,000 training samples. So again, the data is small, and the, the, the model itself is absolutely tiny. The model operates without pre-training 
or chain of thought data, yet achieves nearly perfect performance on challenging tasks, including complex Sudoku puzzles and optimal pathfinding in large mazes. Furthermore, HRM outperforms much larger models with significantly longer context windows on the Abstraction and Reasoning Corpus, or ARC Challenge, a key benchmark for measuring artificial general intelligence capabilities. These results underscore HRM's potential as a transformative advancement towards universal computation and general purpose reasoning systems. And then you can see the inspiration as you've got meta representation or higher level reasoning and then low level representation. This is biologically inspired and you can see how the two of them communicate with each other. And of course, the blue shows how well HRM actually does. Now, of course, these are not all of the frontier models. There are some that are significantly smarter. So I don't think HRM would do as well as them, but still this is reasonable because something like O3 Mini High is still orders of magnitude larger in terms of the number of parameters it has than HRM. So that's a pretty reasonable comparison. And then very quickly, I'll touch on this graph right here where you can see that other models basically saturate. They can't get any better. They get to a certain point of accuracy, like about 65, 70%, something like that. And they just can't get any more accurate. But then when you throw in hierarchical reasoning, it actually just the kicks in and gets to basically 100% on this Sudoku challenge. And that really comes from bifurcating the reasoning into smart thinking about things or slower reasoning and then fast computational tools to actually do the work. So again, I will leave a link to both of these papers in the description so you can read them at more length. And if you want me to go into more detail about the HRM paper, which is reasonably complex, you know, you have to think about it for a while, I would be happy to do that. Just let me know in the comments. But what I want to do here is kind of synthesize the ideas behind these two papers and come up up with my theory for the future. Basically what you've got here is the beginnings of optimization. You've got these large language models that are amazing and they can do amazing things, but they are incredibly inefficient, but they're also really, really smart. So if you need those real, real high end smarts, that's exactly what you're going to go for. But most tasks only require minimal smarts. They only require something to be able to operate well enough. And in that instance, it's overkill to be using these gigantic models on that. You want a smaller, more computationally and economically efficient model to be able to do those jobs. And that's where I believe we're actually heading for a combination here. We're looking at a hybrid system between these SLIMs and large language models. And that might be a top-down model in some instances, or it might be a sequential model. So a top-down model would be large language model thinks about something and then assigns a bunch of SLIMs as agents to actually do the task. So if I asked it to solve one of those math Olympiad problems or something, the large language model Model would look at the problem and figure out what it's asking, right? And then it would say like, oh, I've got all these really small little agents that can go and run around and do the individual tasks I need. And then they can give me their outputs and I can combine them back together, check whether it's right or wrong again or something like that, and then produce an answer. So that's a top-down methodology. Another methodology, which would probably be used in more instances than that, is a sequential one, which is where you start with a slim. So in other words, you might be talking to your phone or your Tesla might be driving on the road or something, and it's actually actually operating at very, very high speed with a low parameter model that's focused on being efficient for power, for computation, and super low latency. And then if the requests actually exceed what these slims can do, they pass it up to a large language model, a big reasoning model, usually probably in the cloud, someplace far away at a big data center or something. And that can think about something for a few seconds and then can return an answer back to these or other slims that can go on and actually execute the task in the real world to to take care of whatever it needs to take care of. And you could see how this can function in real world robotics. So we'll take a Tesla Optimus, for example. Let's say it's working in a factory. It's using the onboard slims. It's just using what it's got internally to actually do a task. It's putting wheels on cars or something, right? That's what it's doing all day. So that's a pretty basic thing. And once it's got that training, it can just do that over and over again. But then all of a sudden the factory catches on fire and a bunch of smoke alarms and things like that go off. And at that point, it's far beyond the capability of the slim, it doesn't know what the heck it's doing. And so what it could do is pass that new data, new information off to a large language model to think for a few seconds, right? It could think for five or 10 seconds about what needs to happen. It's the kind of thing where if this happened to a human being, you know, you're just working, 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 and all of a sudden the circumstances change. There's smoke, there's fire alarms going off. You're like, oh, I need to think about this for a second. You go tick, 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 right? Your higher order reasoning comes in and says, well, what's the best thing to do right now? We'll probably either run away 
hey, or put out the fire, right? Go get some water and put out the fire. One of those two options happens. That's the kind of thing that a reasoning model at a distance could do and then send back information. And then that overrides the original programming. And what it could do is invoke some new slims that are on board, which are, well, let's walk or let's run or something. Let's use those mechanisms, that type of computation to either go get some water and help fight the fire, which is something the large language model could pass back. Or if it looks like it's out of control and there's nothing you can do about it to at least save yourself to get out of the factory and to leave so that you're reducing the capex loss on the fire. And that same sort of thing could happen in a full self-driving scenario. In other words, you could be driving down the road and maybe a tornado or something like that happens, right? And there's other cars up front that are like, hey, there's a tornado. So there's information that gets passed to the vehicle. But what would happen is that's beyond what the basic full self-driving is able to handle. What it could do is then pass that off to a model like Grok. And if you haven't seen my chat about Grok and the future of Grok in Teslas, definitely check it out up here. I'll leave that at the end of the video as well. But basically, if it hits something like that, if it hits like there's a tornado up ahead on your route, that's something very out of the ordinary, very edge case. It would pass that up to Grok. Grok would think about that and then pass back a recommended course of action, a rerouting, a something or other to get the car out of a bad situation. And that's that sort of hybrid model I'm talking about. So again, one is more top down. You ask a very, very complicated question and the large language model acts as an orchestrator, like a conductor of the orchestra, and it passes off tasks very much like a mixture of experts sort of situation. But here you've got these experts are very, very small, very, very focused and very, very fast agents that are slims. And then the other model, as I was talking about, is sequential. You're always going to the slim first, but if it realizes that it can't handle the situation, it then passes it off, right? It's like it's a tag team thing in wrestling or whatever. It's like you tag the other guy and the reasoning model can come in and it can think about it for longer. And it doesn't matter if it takes a few seconds because this is not something that's like, don't crash right now, right? That's still being handled by the slim while the other things are being thought about. And then when there is a response, when the large language model has some information, it passes it back down to the slims, which are then reassigned to do whatever task they need to do. So what I'm seeing for the future here is a hybridized system of these slims and large language models, each handling tasks that are better suited for what they need to do. Is this going to get us closer to artificial super intelligence? It might. It's going to be kind of a different methodology than humans. We are all sort of individuated, right? We're just in single entities. But of course, we can operate in a corporate sense in the sense of like working for a company or something like that, which is able to produce much more than an individual is. And so if we think about these things, these collections as sort of corporate or societal or something, that's where we might be able to get to artificial super intelligence, because we've got a kind of hive mind with some very, very intelligent large language models that are sitting on top and thinking about things in a more general sense, and then potentially millions of these slims that are running on edge devices that are running really, really fast that can actually take care of the operational needs of what the large language models are thinking about. So is this combination of hierarchical thinking and small language models plus large language models the secret to getting from where we are today? Is this the architectural breakthrough that needs to happen to get to artificial superintelligence? You know, I don't know, <laughs> but it seems like it's one of those things that could actually lead to that because it would allow compute resources to be utilized much more efficiently than they are today. And that would allow intelligence to grow exponentially because you would have the same amount of compute, but you would be using it, let's say 10x or 100x more effectively. That can make the intelligence grow by 10x or 100x, and that can get us well past the smartest human being to the sort of corporate level of multiple humans operating together, the equivalent of that, and that gets us to artificial super intelligence. All right, folks, so that's my position paper or my position video here. What do you think about all of this? Let me know in the comments. While you're down there, if you don't mind liking the video. It really, really helps because YouTube algorithm depends on that. And if you want more of this kind of content, please consider subscribing for more of this, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.